Good afternoon and welcome to the, whatever today is, January 31st, last day of the month, council work session, and we are looking forward to the presentation ahead of us. So, manager. Thank you, Mayor, and uh, we have what we hope is a very informative, exciting conversation today. I'll turn it over to Denny and his team to uh, get us going and uh, go from there. So. so, good afternoon, Mayor, City Council, Denny Bro. Planning and Development Director. Um, I'm here joined uh, with uh, Dyke Dame, Jim Afkins for Williams, from uh, Williams and Dame Development. Um, today really is, uh, and, and they have other members of their team that you'll get introduced to here shortly, um, but today really is an exciting day. Um, I tried to go back and figure out when did this downtown to the, can reconnect downtown to the river concept actually start. Uh, I got back to 2000, wow. um, which was our, our vision for greater downtown Eugene. Actually, the first word is our river. Um, there's a whole chapter in here about reconnecting downtown to the river. So it's been at least 20 years that we've been talking about this goal. So as we're moving closer, it's, it is a, a really exciting day. Um, you know, following the downtown vision, we had a downtown plan adopted in 2004. There's a whole chapter in our downtown plan around reconnecting downtown to the river and our downtown riverfront. Um, that aspiration became more real um, uh, when we adopted the riverfront, Iwa Riverfront Master Plan in 2010. And then now it's even more real because we actually have an agreement to purchase the property which is expected to close next month. So um, we will actually be the proud owner of this riverfront site after 20 plus years of trying to get here. So it is, it is an exciting day. Um, we've been working in partnership with Williams and Dame for the past several months to develop really a redevelopment concept for this re riverfront property. Um, while at the same time, um, we've been also um, beginning the process of, of designing a riverfront park. So both of those components really uh, um, provide that opportunity to finally reconnect to the river. Our goal for today really is for you to hear directly from their team on how they plan to help us meet the goals and expectations of our Riverfront Master Plan. And in other words, we wanna make sure we have a great concept first. Uh, and so um, that really was what today is about. And then, you know, as, assuming we feel like we're on the right path and going in the right direction, the next level, layer of com conversation will really need to be what is it gonna take to make all of this happen? And that's when we talk talking about purchase price and infrastructure investments and all those kinds of things. But the goal for today is really to make sure that we're getting it right. So with that, I'm gonna hand it over to these guys and. Let them tell you all about it. Thank you. Thank you and welcome. Thank you very much. Appreciate the opportunity to uh, talk to you today. Uh, my name is Dyke Dame. My partner is not here. My partner is Homer Williams. My younger partner here, Jim Atkins, is here. We'll let Jim do most of the talking. Um, little background about our company. If you add it up, the length of time I've been in this business, my partner has been in this business, and Jim, we probably have been doing this collectively for over 100 years. So we have specialized in the, the last two decades in what I call urban subdivisions or developing neighborhoods in an urban env environment, which, will, which Jim will get into in much more detail. Uh, one of the things that we've enjoyed in our uh, recent months in coming to Eugene and working on this property, and as you know, we were originally uh, tried to get involved in this a number of years ago, but one of the things that's been a very pleasant experience for us uh, professionally is to work with your staff. You got a great group, and they know what they're doing. Uh, they're going to be careful. Uh, we're both going to be careful. We're going to get the job done. This project is, as I would call it, in our wheelhouse. We've done this before. We plan on doing this again. And I'm 80 years old. This may be my last deal. I'm not going to blow it. <laughs> um, I'm going to turn it over to Jim. He can take it from there. So. Uh, thank you very much. My name is Jim Atkins. Uh, thank you, Dyke. Um, uh, thank you again to the council for having us. And, and again, I would reiterate uh, Dyke's comment. 
thank you to the staff for all the good work these last several months. I think we've, we've moved the ball quite a bit down the field. Uh, I'm going to start with a bit of a, a personal story, and it was it, 22 years ago, I wanted to steer my, my career from engineering into development, and I uh, was pursuing a property on the coast. I was told I should go contact a Mr. Dame, who was a real estate developer living in Yahats, who was familiar with the project. We met on the property. We chatted a bit about the property, and although we didn't work on that site, he asked me if there was if I could, would have time to take on one or two assignments. Well, one or two turn, turned into two to four, and 22 years later, I look back and was enmeshed in Pearl District, South Waterfront, our work in downtown LA. And one of the lessons learned across of that, you might imagine there were many lessons that both Homer and Dyke have taught me. One, in particularly as it resonates with these kind of projects, is regular and consistent communication. And being able to engage with the other party, being having frank and honest, open dialogue, um, trying to understand the other party's point of view, trying to understand what the other party's perspective are, is, is key to getting this, this kind of deal done. So I share that with you because I think that was a, a starting point for our relationship and I think is as germane today as it was 22 years ago. But again, we're here to talk about this legacy opportunity that the city has in front of it. Um, we'd like to introduce ourselves today, our team. We'll get into that a bit more. We want to present these jointly developed design concepts for your review, your input. Um, we want to talk about how they relate back to the 2010 master plan and, and the subsequent work. And we also want to have a brief discussion about how this work ties together with the work you're doing on the Riverfront Park. So, a little photo of some of us and some of our work. Um, as Dyke, and, as Dyke mentioned in our introduction, envisioning and executing these kind of sustainable urban neighborhoods is what our company has done uh, in South Waterfront, in Portland's Pearl District, and in downtown Los Angeles' South Park neighborhood. We like to think that over the years we've made a good, we've, that we've been a good partner with our public partners, that we've made a difference, and that we've helped create neighborhoods where people like to live, work, and play, and we think we can do that again here in Eugene. Of course, neighborhoods and communities don't come about because of one or two individuals or one or two companies. Um, done right, they grow organically at the right pace. They grow in an iterative, sometimes even circuitous fashion. And they grow because lots of people got involved along the way and had an opinion, made a contribution, and had some input. And today is about getting that type of feedback and together creating this neighborhood. When we re-engaged with the city staff earlier last year under the terms of the Exclusive Negotiating Agreement, or ENA, we went back to these earlier work products. First, the, 20, the 2010 plan, the 2012 specific area plan, and the subsequent work completed in 2013 and 2014. This work uh, and this foundation was well conceived and was thoughtfully developed and really put us on the right path. And we're here to uh, continue to advance that and to refine that work and built on what's been started before us. Specifically, when we looked at the 2010 plan, uh, we specifically considered its design objectives, key concepts, and guiding principles that were set forth in that work. I won't highlight every one of these, but there's a few worth mentioning because I think they're important for what we're talking about today. First, that is to create a flexible framework. Um, we've learned over many of these years-long projects, flexibility is the key to success. You, we can't predict the future. The evolution of Forest Heights, the Pearl District South Waterfront, our work in Los Angeles occurred in ways that we couldn't have imagined. And you didn't and you recognize that too when you when you instilled this in your original guiding principles. And we're really here to continue to talk about that flexible framework. Uh, to activate the street edge and support the public realm. One of the key design tenants I've heard Homer uh, repeatedly admonish me with is pay attention to the first 30 feet. Or it's corollary, give me four corners and we can build a neighborhood. The conceptual plans we'll, that we will present today, keep in mind these lessons learned on how to, and, and what we've learned on how to design, activate urban and green streets. And lastly, the emphasis on connections. You made an emphasis on connections in this 2010 plan, um, and, 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 we, and we concur with that. Connecting public spaces, connections using green streets, a potential pedestrian bridge. We couldn't agree more with the emphasis in our work, whether it's been moving people by bike or by foot or by streetcar or by urban tram, has been a constant theme in our work as well over the years. So we studied this 2010 plan and its subsequent iterations, and our collective work concluded that these goals and objectives, these ideas, these guiding principles could really be distilled down into four themes that our design team continued to follow. 
And these are that the neighborhood be renovated and repurposed, that it be inclusive, that it be sustainable, and that it be connected and seamless. And what, is, what do some of those ideas mean? Connected and seamless recognizes the focus on connections to downtown, connections to the, to the city through its trail system, a, poten a potential pedestrian and bike bridge to Alton Baker Park, and to design these connections so that they seem seamless, like they're always intended to be there. Sustainable means the obvious, um, a sustainable green neighborhood. Uh, we have a history of green development. We developed the first a green LEED certified neighborhood in the country in South Waterfront. We developed the first two LEED gold condominiums in the state of California. This is in our DNA. Um, but sustainable also means economically sustainable. In other words, right-sizing the amount of retail to create vibrancy, but not too much that it can't sustain itself over time. Sustainable also means economically sustainable in the context of perhaps a district homeowners association and part of that money contributing to maintenance of these public spaces. Inclusive means that the neighborhood, especially the Riverfront Park and Plaza, be inviting to the community and the public at large. It also means that there be a variety of housing types at a variety of price points. So we've proposed, you'll see for sale townhomes, market rate apartments, and I've also included a, a site for a potential affordable housing community. And lastly, that it be renovated and repurposed. This begins obviously with repurposing a land that's long been used for institutional or industrial purposes, but it also means reimagining what the steam plant might be. It means reusing and perhaps celebrating the beautiful timber trusses on site elsewhere in the development. And it also means renovating and improving the downtown riverfront link to the current trail system. So I'd like next to introduce our design team who's going to talk more about some of the specifics. We've been working with Sarah Architects from Portland. We've completed several projects with Sarah over the years. The team has been the team is led by Kurt Schultz, who leads their urban their residential design studio. Kurt is a Eugene native, a U of O graduate, and his awareness of the build environment in Eugene began at a young age as his father is an architect, now retired, that practiced here in Eugene. The planning effort has been led by Martin Gloucester Van Loon. He brings to the team a great history of placemaking projects along waterfronts around the world. And lastly, the team's civil engineer, who's available here today, Scott Shoemaker. I've personally known Scott for over 15 years. Scott was our lead engineer on the South Waterfront project and has brought a lot of those lessons learned about designing these kind of urban neighborhoods adjacent to a river, uh, has brought that experience and lessons learned here to our team today. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Kurt. I didn't have to kick Jim once underneath the table. He did a really good job. <laughs> good job, Jim. All right. Well, again, I'm Kurt Schultz. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today. Make sure this is on. There we go. Um, I'm a principal with Sarah Architects. Uh, I am also born and raised here in Eugene, so this uh, project has a lot of personal connections to, for me. I, I went to... Crest Drive Elementary, Churchill High School, and then the U of O School of Architecture. Um, my father's a retired architect here in Portland, so he calls me nearly every week to say, you better do a really good job on this project. <laughs> so uh, we're taking that to heart, and uh, it's really been a pleasure working with city staff, uh, as well as the Williams and Dame team on this project. Um, Sarah Architects, we uh, are a Portland-based firm. Uh, we have about 140 employees, and we are an employee-owned company. Uh, so I don't own the company myself. It's actually owned by all of us. We have been, we just celebrated our 50th anniversary, so we've been in business a long time, uh, not nearly as much as uh, Dyke, but uh, <laughs> uh, almost. Our, our firm specializes in uh, sustainable placemaking and sustainable urban design. Uh, we're actually sought out uh, all, all around the country for our expertise in sustainably designed communities and buildings, uh, which we really take to heart. We also have a very collaborative culture in our office. We have studios in urban design and planning, uh, market rate housing, which I run, hospitality, office, and uh, civic and educational work. We really pride ourselves in collaborating with our clients, with the neighborhoods that we're designing buildings for, and, uh, and interdisciplinary collaboration within our firm. 
You, uh, we have worked in Eugene. Uh, you may know us for a couple of Eugene projects. Uh, we designed the Tate condominiums over on Ol Olive Street uh, a number of years ago, uh, which we're very proud of. We really pride ourselves on buildings that are well built, built to last, um, have quality uh, materials that are going to last over time. We don't like buildings that are, I would characterize as being kind of thin and flimsy and not looking like they're going to stand up for more than a couple of years. Uh, we like tried and true materials that are that are built to last and are sustainably and thoughtfully designed. Our most recent project in Eugene was the expansion and renovation of the Herb Memorial Union at the University of Oregon, uh, which just opened about a year ago. Uh, this project was is highly sustainable in terms of its LEED Platinum um, certification from the U.S. Green Building Council, but I think we're also proud of it. It's, it's really a place for people, a place for students to interact, and it becomes kind of the heart and hearth of the University of Oregon campus, and we're, we're just pleased to see how well used it is. And uh, with that, I'm going to turn the uh, turn this over to uh, Martin, who is going to discuss some of the urban design thoughts going into our project. Thank you, Kurt. Uh, thank you, Council. Um, yeah, just a real personal note for me. I have a lifelong fascination with cities and riverfronts. I grew up uh, in a very old city, um, surrounded by rivers, and I've, I've picked up on that as a very young lad, and I've been carrying that forward uh, through through my professional life, and I'm very excited to uh, to help be part of this uh, legacy project here, in Eugene. So, so with that, thank you. I've been very excited. It's been a, a great last half year, six, seven months, working with uh, folks trying to make this a reality, and that's really what we've been focusing on, trying to get to a refinement of your great master plan efforts that was a community vision, and we want to build on that. Um, what's really important at this point in time when you start to think about um, realiza realizing those dreams is how can you minimize uncertainty and risk? And that's something we've thought about throughout. And at the same time, you want to do that in a way where you maximize the value for everybody involved, all partners involved. And that's first and foremost for me as an urban designer, uh, the community at large uh, who gets to use the public realm that we're going to be shaping here. And uh, hand in hand with that, it's the private development parcels that we're going to be shaping here. They need to be responsive to that and they need to be viable. And that's something that we have a lot of experience doing. And um, we're going to show you how we think we uh, can do that today. Um, flexibility and resiliency, um, Jim talked about that. I think that speaks for itself. Um, we also want to build it and, and develop it in such a way that we can start building it next year. So there needs to be a certain market reality to our development parcels. And uh, yet they might change over five years. Uh, we might see different market realities and we want to design it in such a way that we can respond to that. And I think we've done that. And finally, uh, really exciting that you have this separate riverfront park uh, project coming up. Um, great timing, and we'll talk a little bit more about how we can integrate with that. So it's been an iterative design process, and I think you've seen this, um, this sketch before, but it's, it's really one that we all cared about. It's, this is about October when we came with, with this sketch that brought a lot of these concepts together. It's about healing the uh, urban fabric of the city. It's about um, connecting to that river, um, a logical extension of the city grid, and really thinking about your Willamette to Willamette concept along 8th Avenue, bringing it all the way to the river, but also maybe introducing this new idea of a, of a second Willamette to Willamette connection through 5th Avenue. And then the role that High Street can play in that uh, sort of framework that we're setting up of connections between downtown and the river. It's really exciting. Um, what you see in this sketch is an early uh, idea that we've carried forward, and that's making a direct connection between Fifth Avenue and the riverfront. The shortest connection possible uh, between uh, the city where there's vibrancy, there's people on that intersection with High Street and Fifth and the Whitaker uh, neighborhood just behind and bring those, that vibrancy, that energy to the riverfront as fast as possible and the shortest distance possible is what our takeoff is right there. And then there's an arrival point at the river um, that's going to be a public place. Um, where we can all gather and from there you can stretch out along the river towards the north or the south and hook up with the uh, steam plant building and farther south. 
Now, this is a very constrained site. I think, I think we all know that. There's a lot of underground utilities. There are buildings. There's a viaduct. There's a railroad that runs along it that has limited crossability. And that is a lot of things to take into account to uh, develop a cohesive master plan. Um, so we critically looked at all of those constraints and looked at ways to minimize them so we can free the site up for maximized value. And um, we looked at utilities. We carefully looked at all the buildings that are on site and um, looked at railroad crossings and think we can narrow it down to a much simpler image um, that looks like this, um, where we take most of the um, utilities that we assume we can relocate and relocate them uh, elsewhere. And we work around the ones that we think are way too costly to, to relocate at this point. And those are the ones in, in dark gray. Uh, furthermore, we uh, have, like I said, critically looked at three of the buildings that are on site, and we're currently assuming that we are going to be uh, relocating or eliminating those. Um, the first building on the corner of 4th and High Street, um, where the uh, daycare is currently, we think we can uh, replace it with a much higher value, higher density uh, infill, which will give us a much uh, more value for that piece of land. Um, the Bow Trust building, beloved building, um, we have carefully looked at it and we feel like it is really an obstacle in getting the maximum value out of this entire piece of property for all of us. Um, it, it's hard to work around. We tried it. Um, we concluded that we get a much better result if we um, bite the bullet and um, work without it. Finally, there's a maintenance building that is close to the, I'll scoot back here and point at it. There's a maintenance building right here adjacent uh, the river uh, park and we think it crowds the river and we'd be much better off uh, if we didn't have it uh, so we can replace it with something much more inviting. So steam plant still on there. We look at it as a repurposed opportunity. But this really uh, helped us. Oh, I should point out one more thing. Um, the railroad crossings. Um, it has become clear that um, the direct connection that we all would hope to make from 8th Avenue is currently uh, unfeasible. It's going to take a long time to get the railroad companies there. So we are working with an alternative uh, solution that the city provided as a, a new given that comes just off of that. Um, actually, it's kind of at the extension of the original uh, 8th Avenue alignment, I assume. But there's a roundabout that will uh, unlock uh, property to the east and then gets us into into this um, site. So that's a current condition right there, a current uh, railroad crossing that we'll keep working with. So this is uh, our illustration of what that could all look like, how that could all fall into uh, into place if we uh, work around those uh, those remaining constraints and free up the land as we can. So I want to take you through a series of slides and describe this plan for you. This is a composite illustration. Um, our, I talked about our big party at uh, Fifth Avenue. Uh, this is the Fifth Street Market building uh, on High Street. And we've decided that, like I said, the shortest route from a vibrant neighborhood uh, hub, uh, maybe f potential future four corners to the river is really happening right here, right now. This is also a site that you could relatively easy start development on soon. So rather than designing that as a full street, we are designing that as a pedestrian plaza and Festival Street moving uh, farther down so that this is really inviting to pedestrians and bicyclists first. Um, we want to get a lot of people to the riverfront. We don't necessarily want a lot of cars there, I don't think. So um, by really uh, starting with how would pedestrians get here soon and fast and where would they start from, we are aiming to provide that access right here. And that takes you under the viaduct. Uh, straight shot to the river, and then we have an arrival here in uh, what we called uh, River Plaza uh, Park that opens up to the riverfront park that runs along the river. The steam plant uh, features prominently at the end of the, uh, not the end, but at the southern end of uh, our composition here. So from that riverfront plaza, there's a view to the steam plant, and then that will take you back to that 8th Street connection, or vice versa. 
Another feature of our um, proposal is a pedestrian bridge. I think uh, bringing the river to the city, bringing the city to the river is one thing, but we want to even reach across. I think you talked about that in your original master plan. Um, what if this became a portal, an entrance piece into the downtown from destinations on the other side of the river? It can be quite powerful to welcome them in a place like this. So I want to break apart um, the public amenities uh, first of what we're proposing here, which is a connection of urban spaces and places with a lot of variety and richness. And then the next slide we'll talk about the development program that we're currently thinking about um, around those places. So again, I'll, I'll start here with the uh, 5th Street and uh, 5th Avenue and High Street intersection. We'll have a plaza here. This will be a green street with uh, stormwater features that may start in a very formal way and then become more organic as we get closer to the river. Um, there will be buildings that I'll talk about in a second on the north end with active ground floors, retail activating this plaza and this pedestrian access. And we have identified a neighborhood serving retail node right here, labeled number six, that um, we'd love to see a preschool in, for instance. And there's some, some space around that where they could have an outdoor uh, play area. Um, farther down under the viaduct, um, we think that'd be a great spot right here to have some outdoor recreation, a pocket park, park of sorts. And as you continue down to the river, you arrive at that riverfront plaza that I, that I spoke about before. There's an overlook where Fifth Street uh, meets the, the boardwalk and the trail. And then directly to the south of that, we propose a restaurant with outdoor seating so you can all enjoy. Everybody can get, get to that place and enjoy a beer or a meal on the river. And it's a great spot right here because of the uh, views upriver, across river, and downriver. It's, it's a really strategic spot to do that. Um, the eWeb, or excuse me, the steam plant sits right here, and we look at that as a repurposed uh, um, future adaptive reuse with maybe a roof terrace, uh, lookout point, uh, again, maybe outdoor seating opportunities. It is served with a, with a vehicular drop-off and viewpoint as well, directly south of the building. Um, the bridge, we're proposing a lands um, not directly at the end of 5th, but on the other end of the park, so that we set up this sort of polar uh, extremes where people will be walking back and forth quite a bit. You, you get to the river first, you enjoy it, take it all in, and then you figure out how can you get to the other side. But we've brought the other side uh, of that bridge, and perhaps there's some sort of vertical feature there, in line with 5th Avenue, so that we hope to set up some sort of view corridor towards a landmark across the river that beckons you and leads you all the way in and across, starts thinking about the other side of the river as well. And again, the uh, Riverfront Park project um, that you all be doing runs along that entire length. We've actually adopted the, uh, as much of the uh, line work that you had in the previous master plan. It, it's yet to be designed, but we think it's a great opportunity to integrate these two. Oh, could you go back one slide? Please. Uh, the other thing that Martin uh, Thank you. didn't mention is the hotel. We actually thought this location here would be the, the best location of the site for a, uh -huh. uh, for a hotel. It would have visibility from uh, Coburg Road and the viaduct, which is always uh, looked for from hotel uh, flags and operators. But it also could have a drop off and a main, a main entry that would, that would in front the new riverfront plaza and the riverfront park. That's correct. That's correct. Yeah, so I'll start with that. Again, it's also highlighted on, on this um, development program potential. Um, there it is, hotel. We've also labeled it uh, apartments, slash. Um, like I said earlier, we are dimensioning these parcels so that we can have accommodate a variety of uses. Um, should we not be able to uh, land a hotel operator, um, this would be a great site for apartments as well. So apartments is an important uh, component. Um, we have mixed-use housing apartments over here in 3A along high between 4th and 5th. And as I said, um, there will be active ground floors retail on this uh, bottom portion right here. And um, they are flanked by townhomes, uh, blocks of townhomes that will be alley-loaded, fronting here on a private or semi-private court. They'll pr provide a pedestrian path through. And then some townhomes here fronting on 5th Street. There are more townhomes here at 4 and 5. 
flanking Fifth Avenue. So Fifth Avenue, we'll, we'll look at that in a second here, will really have a character of, of stoops and, and three-story buildings aligning it. Um, there's another apartment building here at 9A, mixed-use housing. It could have ground floor activated here. And then the affordable housing that Jim mentioned is uh, located right here adjacent to the uh, steam plant and in close proximity to the river right here. The taller buildings of the mixed-use housing are fronted by a row of townhomes again, um, so that we really step up the scale from the river to the, to the taller buildings of the city. And then I mentioned the restaurant already, but it sits right here. Um, just across, not to be forgotten, across Forest Avenue, there are some properties that are part of this deal. Um, there's an opportunity for mixed-use housing on site two here uh, on Mill Street and Fourth. And uh, it's a tight site, but we could fit some more townhomes in right here on Fourth to really shape these streets and uh, make strong street edges, which is one of your goals. Um, Today we're really focused on how to organize this, this um, land division if you want. So this is the underlying parcelization that we are currently at and that we're, we're wanting to uh, hear your feedback on. This is what makes all that goodness that we just saw possible in very simple terms. What are going to be the parcels? What is going to be the public right of way that will be unlocking these parcels and what sort of open space tracks or parcels will you have as well? So in all simple terms, they have names and numbers the parcels do and the open space is uh, colored green so there's the the what we call riverfront plaza and the open space under the viaduct and basically everything else is a public right away and with that you're probably wondering what that would look like um, while you're in it instead of looking at it from the top down so um, Kurt's going to talk about that Okay, I'm going to walk you through some ways to kind of visualize what uh, what this is, is going to look like and how you're going to experience the master plan beyond the kind of urban design framework that, that Martin described. When we begin working on what I'm going to refer to as the vertical architecture, that's essentially everything that's coming out of the ground three-dimensionally, uh, we're going to be really focusing on using some of the principles that have already been set up and established here uh, by the City of Eugene, in particularly the Community Design Handbook, which which I think is a really well-written and well-crafted document is going to be a great guideline for us. It's something we've read and we really believe in those same principles for our, our urban design projects. Creating buildings um, and, and streetscapes that, that integrate nature and really respond to your particular climate. Um, evoking the sense of place of Eugene. We really want these buildings to not feel like they're just coming from outer space, but they're really coming from the, the heart and the fabric of downtown Eugene. So it's that sense of the fabric of Eugene extending toward the river. We want to bring the streets to life, and that's really focusing on not only the uses on the ground floor of those buildings, but the first 30 feet, uh, as Dyke was saying, that really uh, makes great urban design and great urban architecture. And finally, leaving a building legacy of, of handsome buildings that, uh, that are long-lasting, that are timeless, that are well-made, well-built, and are of, qual of lasting quality. To kind of help walk through what some of the different uh, building types might be, we've got a couple of images of projects that uh, both Williams and Dam and Sarah have worked on to kind of give you an idea of what we're thinking about. Some of the lower scaled buildings, particularly some of the townhouses, what we're envisioning are very uh, urban scaled townhouses, not what I would call more suburban scaled townhouses. These are both projects in the Pearl District in, in Portland uh, that Williams and Dam was associated with, where they they are uh, well built, uh, highly crafted with, with quality materials. They tend to have raised stoops that, that create um, kind of a transition from the public realm to the private realm um, and, and, and transitions from the street into the, into the townhouses themselves. But we also try to set these up so that a lot of the ground floor of these townhouses, particularly like along uh, the Fifth Avenue extension, can be used as live work residence or even retail. Um, if you look at these buildings in the Pearl, you'll actually find many of these spaces are actually occupied by small businesses on the ground floor and that they live above. And uh, that's an opportunity we want to 
make sure that we we keep uh, uh, available to us to help activate uh, the new master plan. These are some mid-rise buildings that our firm has been associated with in different neighborhoods in the city of Portland. What we're really looking to create with our mid-rise buildings are, uh, first off, to kind of match the context. We try to do buildings that are very contextually sensitive and, and, and match the quality and the character and the architecture of the existing fabric. We really want to enhance that sense of scale in the city of Eugene where no buildings are too large. So even larger projects, we try to break down the scale into components that are, you know, maybe no more than 50 to 100 feet wide. So uh, you really get that sense of fine grain scale throughout the building. We try to strive for uh, quality and permanence of materials in all of our projects. So we look to tried and true materials like brick, uh, painted steel, wood, um, even stucco that um, that will last and be long lasting and, and try to avoid more artificial and, and um, man-made materials, I suppose, that are you see now on the market. And finally, uh, we strive to really create active ground floors, that first 33, 30 feet of the building with ground ground floor shops, canopies, multiple entrances, multiple ways to get in and out of that building. So whether it's residential, retail, or commercial spaces, we're really activating those streets. So I'm going to walk you through a series of sketches that kind of evoke uh, how we feel this. it might feel like uh, in a few years down the road walking through this development uh, so you can see how it might be experienced because it's always hard to see it just looking on at uh, two-dimensional plans. So today this is the intersection at 5th and High looking east. Um, you would hardly know that the Willamette River exists back there. There's so many barriers from the, uh, from the uh, railroad crossing to wall walls to the viaduct and everything else in between to feel like how would I ever get to the river from this location. So this is the same view, uh, hopefully a few years down the road. And this is again looking east from the Fifth Street Market, uh, looking east on Fifth Avenue. So this would be the crossing uh, to the Festival Street, uh, just on the other side of the railroad crossing down the Fifth Avenue extension. So this is, we're gonna be taking a walk down, uh, down the Fifth Avenue extension here over a couple of slides. What you see right in front of you is the Festival Street, a retail opportunity that we think would be ideal for a, a preschool or a child care center or some sort of a place for children with uh, outdoor uh, play areas associated with it to bring that activity across Fifth Avenue. On the other side, just to the north of Fifth Avenue, is a four-story uh, market-rate apartment building with ground floor retail uh, that uh, Martin showed you in the master plan. So there'd be ground floor retail and shops and restaurants spilling onto the Festival Street. Beyond, you might see some uh, uh, townhouses that are very urban in scale that might have those live-work uh, units on the ground floor. And then finally, you see the viaduct um, and potentially the, the pedestrian bridge that will lead you as a beacon down through Fifth Avenue. This, uh, on the other side of the viaduct here, you're seeing, you're seeing the back side of what might potentially be the be a four-story hotel. We've been keeping, we've been making the assumption that most of these buildings would be in about a four-story scale. We think that's an appropriate scale for this height. Um, you know, we, we may consider five-story buildings, but right now we're creating the same amount of density that was in the original master plan with, with four-story rather than buildings that are taller, trying to uh, keep something that really is matching the scale of Eugene. So now we've moved a little bit further down uh, Fifth Avenue. We've gone under the viaduct. We've gone past Mill Street. And now we're approximately one block away from the Willamette River. So over on, whoops, go back one. To the north side would be uh, townhouses that, again, would have raised stoops, very urban design townhouses that could also have live work opportunities on the ground floor. These are typically three-story townhouses that may be set back on the third level to create some more outdoor seating and outdoor terraces. To the other side is the four-story hotel or potential market rate apartment building that would have ground floor retail, uh, canopies, places for connectivity on that bottom 33 to the 30 feet of the building, upper floors of, of hotel. And then finally, a restaurant uh, destination, which is the destination building that would sit right on the waterfront. 
you now actually can see the waterfront and see the uh, Alton Baker Park in the background. Now we've arrived at the river. So really this is our destination place. This is where Fifth Avenue meets the river. We're now looking south down the, uh, down the promenade along the river into uh, Riverfront Park and the Riverfront Plaza. Uh, we can see the transmission tower, which is not going anywhere down, in, down, in the, uh, down to the south. Uh, you can also see the repurposed steam plant, uh, which may be repur repurposed into a retail or commercial office opportunity, maybe even shops and restaurants and uh, a roof terrace. In the background, you see um, some lower scale uh, townhouses that in front the promenade. In the background, you see some of the four story um, uh, affordable housing project back here, market rate apartments at four stories just to the north of that and um, some more of the townhouses that stepped down in scale. We really felt it was important to have that stepping down a scale to the river. We didn't want the four-story buildings to be right on the promenade. We want more light, more air, more sun coming down to the river and the promenade. This is the Anchor restaurant that will have outdoor seating, uh, places to dine uh, and, and people watch, watch people bike and walk by along the river. And just beyond the restaurant is the new Riverfront Park. So this is a view now uh, looking back to the west of the existing buildings. You have the, uh, the E-Web um, office building to the north, the Bo, the Bo Trust building, operations center, and then the maintenance building in front. But for the most part right now, this is mostly all asphalt and gravel and uh, not, a, not a place for people. What we envision uh, within the master plan, this is actually, if you're hovering over the river looking back to the, to the scene that I showed you previously, this is the Fifth Avenue connector that Martin was describing that terminates at the river. Um, this is the existing E-Web building. Just behind it are some of the townhouses with potential live work on the ground floor. On the other, this is the viaduct. On the other side of the viaduct are some of the four-story market rate uh, housing projects that, uh, that are on those northernmost parcels. Way in the back here is the uh, four-story mixed-use housing project with ground floor retail closer to the Fifth Street Market. This is the hotel. So as you, as you drive uh, down Fifth Avenue and turn, there'll be kind of a turn roundabout, turn around drop off area at the river where you can also park and get off and access uh, the new riverfront park. This would be the main entry to the hotel that actually has views out toward the river itself and the hotel has river views. This would be the anchor uh, restaurant that uh, is really is four-sided because it actually has frontages on all sides. It fronts uh, Fifth Avenue. It in fronts the new promenade, the outdoor seating, places for people. And then in the new riverfront park and plaza, there might be some stormwater water features. It may step and cascade down uh, toward, the, toward the riverfront park itself and the promenade. And then over on the far right side is the stepping of the townhouses to the four-story apartments in scale. So you get that sense of height stepping down and cascading back down to the river. So now just kind of taking the wider view, looking back to the city, this is the view of the, of the property currently along the Willamette River. And this is really what we envision at, at kind of final build out. And that's really that sense of the Willamette to Willamette connection and the sense of the downtown and the vibrancy and the urban quality of downtown actually jumping High Street and continuing all the way to the river's edge. So fifth, um, Fifth, which stops right now at the railroad crossing, now crosses all the way to the river, um, under the viaduct, past the hotel, past the restaurants, and along the townhouses and apartments. That takes you to the river, and there might be some sort of a, a beacon or anchorage for the, uh, for the new pedestrian bridge that becomes a wayfinding device down Fifth Avenue. That really opens to the outdoor heart of the whole project, which is Riverfront Plaza, Riverfront Park, 
that is uh, basically embraced by the restaurant, the hotel, the apartments, the townhouses. This is the affordable housing in the back, and then finally the repurposed steam plant. But you also get that sense of the, the, the stepping down and cascading of scale down to the river and really trying to get that sense of vibrancy and, and active urban spaces continuing all the way to this, this new wonderful river destination. And with that, I'm going to give it back to Martin to talk about some uh, comparisons between kind of the evolution of the master plan that we're proposing today and how that compares to the earlier master plan. Thanks, Kurt. I just want to look at this one one more time. <laughs> I think uh, you know your your theme of um, where the city meets the river, where the river meets the city, um, is really highlighted in this sketch. You know, it's it's not a handshake. We really have been trying to make an embrace. When when you use those words, embrace, I think that really is uh, is the key to this whole site. How can the city embrace the river and vice versa? And we've created space to do that. So how does that compare to uh, where you've been before? Well, let's put them side by side and then see for yourself. I think um, to us it looks very familiar, very recognizable, um, but I'll break it down in the next couple of slides into uh, a couple of themes to, to really dig into uh, what we've done. Um, what is, I think, um, is very uh, strong about this is um, it's almost the same grid as you used to have in the plan on the left. Uh, there was a connection from fifth to the river, but it was a little bit offset. And it's as if we've, we've pulled that down and we've, we've stretched it back and clicked it in place with, with the existing Fifth Street, uh, Fifth Avenue alignment and just made the entire grid more of Eugene, like, it, like the rest of Eugene. So pedestrian and bike connections are going to be key. On the left side, you see the, um, the diagram showing the 2010 uh, connections for bikes and pedestrians. Um, ours is very similar currently for the refinement here. Uh, we've added the uh, pedestrian and bike bridge, obviously, but we have a lot of space for people, and uh, particularly in the heart of the, of the entire neighborhood. Um, the circulation pattern is very similar. We do need to bring cars here. People do need to be able to reach their homes or their destinations, or they might just want to cruise through and see what's going on the riverfront. Um, the only change, I think, is what we are doing is we're keeping the main circulation adjacent to the railroad tracks, uh, farthest away from the river, closest to existing hinder from, from the, the railroad that people are used to. And that also gives us a little bit more space to um, move the uh, residential components away from, from that railroad. Um, oh, I should, should have pointed out one more thing. You see the um, crossing with 8th Street as, as our new uh, component there that's a given to us. Um, we also have these two drop-off points or, or overlooks that are vehicular next to the steam plant and then the one that um, Kurt described next to the hotel and the riverfront plaza. Um, the parcelization or the block pattern that results from all this, um, it's straightened out. It's much more predictable, much more uh, efficient that way. This is something that the market, uh, when it comes to uh, development partners down the line, is more used to. Uh, not as many acute angles, uh, dimensions that can take on a variety of building types. And then very important, I think, is the porosity of the site or the view corridors through the entire um, property or ways to get to the river. Um, so site transparency, um, I think we have maybe even enhanced what you have had. I think we may have added one or two of those connections uh, that are not just visual, but they're functional uh, connections. So it, it's going to be really crazy to imagine almost how different that's going to be from the current you know no-go zone that we have to be able to go to the river and back in so many places and do short loops do long loops you know and meet people of, of all sorts of re for all sorts of reasons hanging out there uh, whether they're residents whether they're guests whether they're runners whether they're kids it's going to be it's going to be an extension of your downtown vibrancy um, the open space, um, we talked about that briefly, um, the Riverfront Park, uh, your own project is the same location, uh, same size, 
our uh, open space on site um, is um, roughly the same. I think we might have grown it a little bit, uh, but we've relocated it in the heart of the neighborhood. Again, where Fifth Street meets uh, the river uh, and the restaurant and the hotel and the residential component are all grouped around it. And then we have that um, recreational spot under the viaduct. And with that, there's uh, just a point to be made about the integration with that riverfront park. Uh, we're, we are looking forward to working in parallel with this project and specifics. Um, the RFQ has gone out. Um, there's been a proposal submitted, and we're looking forward to finding out uh, what design team the city will uh, hire to, to work with us on. Well, thank you, Kurt and Martin. Um, we're just about wrapping up here. I think the last question is, how do we do this, or, and and when when could we do this? Um, early in the early in our engagement with city staff, I was I was walking the site with Denny, and he made he made the comment in almost an offhanded way. Well, you know what we're really having? We want we want to have a meal and a beer down on the river by hopefully by the track and field championships. And and we've took that kind of as an ongoing theme, and it's popped up in, in a number of our. Uh, um, documents here have a beer on the river by 2021 it's a simple it's a simple idea <laughs> um, but how do we get there uh, so we've proposed over the course of 2018 that we would uh, advance a memorandum of understanding that would become a disposition and development agreement a dda we would then have a due diligence period to complete some further study of the property and then we would close on the first phase of the property at the end of this year meanwhile the river park design and permitting process would continue the infrastructure work would continue through next year. Uh, we would close on the remainder of the land after that infrastructure work is completed. We would like to see our, our first vertical development projects underway in January of 2019 on the northern parcels. The riverfront construction, riverfront park construction work would continue on through late 2020. Our vertical, our first building projects would begin opening in 2020 and the first restaurant opportunities would begin opening up in early 2021 as the Riverfront Greenway and Plaza are completed, allowing us all to have that beer on the river by 2021. So today, this is where we're at. We thank you very much, and hopefully we'd like to talk with you further about how do we get to this vision in the future. Great. Thank you very much. It is such a stunning description. I'm, I find it almost disorienting, actually, knowing what's there now and what you're playing out for us is how this will develop. So thank you for a really uh, inspiring and exciting uh, description and explanation. So I have three counselors in the queue, Betty and Claire. OK, start. take it off, Alan. Very cool, you guys. This is uh, uh, well done. Thank you. Um, I like your plan, I like your vision, and uh, I, I, I think this is a good team, too. Um, I think we've, we've uh, uh, so far, hit a home run. We'll see how far it goes. I think it's the right scale. I think it's the right mix. I think it's the right amount of green space. I really like the restaurant uh, plaza, and, and this actually does bring the river to the city. Mm -hmm. uh, and and uh, I think it's pretty amazing, and it, and it respects the river, which I, I think is very important, especially the Greenway. And having the park there as a buffer, and then the development scaling back is very, very appropriate, and then having the roads be back there, um, which brings up, where's the parking? You always have to talk about parking. <laughs> there, there are approximately, correct me here if I misspeak, Martin or Craig, 210 on-site parking spaces. 210 on-site parking. Can I have, yep. uh, and when I say on-site, I'm talking about on-street, street. on-street parking. And then there, there, is, there is the existing surface parking lot on the e-website. We have not proposed any, anything there. We've, we've had initial conversations with staff about the ability, perhaps in the evening, is there a possibility to negotiate some type of lease? And then in the future, when that converts, consider that for parking that could support the restaurant. Um, and, then the on, and then the buildings would be parked on site. And, and we found that in this in, that in this environment, one and a half parking spaces per unit is kind of what we've been programming, one approximately one per bedroom. But we haven't gotten to that. Un, uh, no, surface parking spaces, but tucked under the building. So the building types that you've seen here, this building type, uh, the hotel, the, the mid-rise uh, multifamily buildings would have what we call tuck under parking. So a surface parking lot surrounded by the building with someone 
uh, opportunity to park on the ground level. Um, and then the uh, row homes or townhomes would have uh, inside garages. So how does the financing model this work? I mean, you broke it up into parks, and, and I, that makes sense to me. So does this get, uh, uh, you guys end up buying the property and then you sell off pieces of it and then finance the project to meet the, mm -hmm. how does that, how does the development actually, and the financing, paying for all this work? Well, you're getting into details. <laughs> and we're happy to do so. <laughs> and, and we're happy to get into that. Uh, at some point in time. I don't want to avoid your question, right? But at this stage of the game, we're just beginning or we're beginning to have discussions about creating an MOU, a Memorandum of Understanding, which would then lead into a, what we call a DDA or a Disposition and Development Agreement. So we have a lot of work to get there. Right, you have a good staff. We've got a good crew. Your attorney will go, do a good job. Ours will do a good job. So, these are things that we have to now buckle down and go to work on. Let me answer your question just by way of maybe example of the South Waterfront. We envisioned this, as Dyke mentioned earlier, it was as a as urban as an urban land subdivision, and then we we create um, a, a entities projects. Got, companies to, to then uh, undertake each vertical project. Right. So it starts with the land, and that's that's really the heart of what the MOU discussions will be about, and then ultimately, then it's more straightforward, then we're, then we're putting together an architectural team, we're designing the building, we're capitalizing that building, and ultimately beginning. So at a very yeah. high level, does, do you, does the city state keep ownership of the land, or does that get transferred? No, our, our our proposal has been that we would buy the majority of the land, but again, that's a detail within the MOU that I don't think we've resolved yet Good, by, by any right means. Answer. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then, so what would the city's role be? The city's role is the park, uh, and then do we have infrastructure roles, and and uh, what other parts, what are we going to have to be doing to help facilitate this? A lot of details to work out, but generally we've proposed to buy the lots as finished lots and to pay the price that it took to build that infrastructure. Oh, so you envision the city putting in the infrastructure and then you buying it. But obviously, yes, but obviously we have to work closely together so that we know that the infrastructure that's being planned and designed works with the buildings that Kurt and his team will design and everything matches up so that it's uh, it all works. Yeah. I, I, why a bridge? Bridges are really expensive. Um, the bridge, we, it was discussed uh, during our presentation as if it was going to happen right away. It, it ain't going to happen right away. You're right. It's expensive. But we think it's something that the city should be thinking about for the future. And uh, we're prepared to put some seed money on the table along with the city to maybe begin some examination or discussions about how that might work and how it might get financed on a long-term basis. Our personal opinion is it would be the right thing to do. Whether you can figure out how to pay for it is another question. So it's not part of this project per se in the beginning. We would like to see it happen and we think it's the right thing to happen. Good. Good to give you another, uh, just to going back to South Waterfront, in the early days of our agreement there in 2000, 2001, there was, there was uh, concepts of a bridge over I-5, and there was concepts of a bridge over the Willamette River. Sixteen years later, that became the Gibbs Street crossing over I-5, and it became the Tillicum Bridge. So, so these ideas sort of get born and built into the plan, and ultimately parties figure out how to get it done, if it's yeah. a good idea. Yeah, that's the pedestrian and, and Max Bridge. Yes, yes. yes. Yeah, that's yeah. pretty cool. Um, and then, can you go back to the timeline? Yes. So, uh, vertical development. as building development. So we, again, we think of horizontal land subdivision building. versus going up. So, yeah, so to, for us to all have a celebratory beer uh, on the river at that restaurant, uh, that'll, that needs to, that stuff needs to occur. Uh, and the riverfront park construction needs to occur 18, or 19 and 20 to get to that place where you can have the uh, 
that beer. Being exactly. We have, we, have, yeah. <laughs> we, have, we have a lot of prep work. Yeah. Well, well done, you guys. I think this is a great plan. Um, I'd love to see it happen. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, one more question. Quiet zone and the railroads. Um, and we've got plans to use urban renewal money to deal with the three that are on the on the south end or the west end of the property. Uh, but there's ten crossings that create horn blasts from the train. Um, how does that impact what you guys are thinking and how, how, what you're doing? Well, it's a great question. Uh, I'm going to answer it this way. Uh, we have built projects alongside railroad tracks. The projects are successful. Uh, we built a hotel in the Pearl District right next to the railroad tracks. We spent extra money for insulation and building materials and glass and so on and so forth. It has one of the highest occupancy rates of any hotel in the, in the city of Portland. There are ways to deal with it. I worked with an affordable housing provider to help them acquire a site in the Pearl District. It sits right next to the railroad tracks. There's ways to deal with it. We have built condos right next to railroad tracks. There's ways to deal with it. And the funny thing is, you kind of get used to it after a while. So, yeah. yeah. I don't know if I've answered your question, but no. there are ways to deal with it. And there's only so much land in these areas, and you have to utilize effectively what's available. I also like the affordable housing part of it. Thanks. Yeah. Greg. Thanks, Mayor. Uh, I agree with Alan. I think this is an excellent presentation. Um, extremely visionary. Uh, I've got a couple of couple of notes here. Um, one is the steam plant. Uh, when I see the steam plant, I think of New Orleans and Jackson Square. And being able to have that kind of multi-level commercial retail facility encompassed in a building that has that, you know, kind of um, connection to the historical part of Eugene that, you know, really I think makes that um, an, an attractive development. Um, is that kind of what you're envisioning for, for the steam plant? We don't think we we will be the owner of the steam plant. We think the city will be the owner of the steam plant. We've we will commit to the city to work hard and with them to bring ideas uh, that make economic and financial sense. What you describe have just described, I think, is a great idea. So I think it's got lots of possibilities. It's a great building, but it's got some issues. You know, they may be seismic or whatever they may ha may happen to be. Okay. And then the other question I had was, um, you talked about uh, pedestrian access, bike access, but there wasn't really any conversation about uh, public transit access. And I'm not thinking about it. I'm thinking about it in two in two uh, ways. One, the investments that we've made nearby this site with uh, MX, but more along the lines of um, the idea of having a um, trolley that connects um, the riverfront, downtown, and you know possibly either Oakway or, and or the university. Um, as being part of this kind of development, um, you know, uh, streetcars are, are uh, streetcar lines are cost prohibitive. But if we can kind of build in a trolley concept that can promote that kind of connectivity, is that something that um, you guys have thought about or? Uh, could possibly envision as being part of this Well, we, we would, excuse me for interrupting you, I'm sorry. Go, go ahead. Um, we would certainly encourage it. Number one, you're right, they're expensive. I've been on the board of Portland Streetcar. I've been involved in the extension of the streetcar line three different times. <laughs> and aside from being on the board of the tram and getting that thing built. So I certainly agree with those points. And if there are financial ways that the city can figure out how to do that, I mean, it just makes it better. There isn't any question about that. Yeah, I'm that. thinking rubber tire trolley kind you of thing. You know, and these things are adaptable. Mm -hmm. They can be adapted over time. So, yeah, would certainly encourage it. 
fewer cars. And we have had discussions about the need to engage with the public transit um, bodies and, and begin planning, but this, the, the street layout we have certainly could accommodate a, a bus or trolley system adding stops. We think that's great. We think it's necessary. It's, it's an important part of the neighborhoods we build. So can we incorporate that in the vision some, somehow? Mm -hmm. Only if somebody says you got the money. <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> we'll, we'll we'll ask the president. He's he has, he wants to put put one you know one and a half trillion dollars in the infrastructure. There you go. There should be a little bit for you know for Eugene infrastructure in this kind of project. I agree. We had someone okay. in transportation. Yeah, Mike. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, could you put that last slide up, please? I, I want to echo, uh, that one? thank you very much. That's the one. I, I want to echo my colleagues and say well done. Uh, thank you very much for a, a, an exciting presentation. Um, I especially like the values listed here, uh, which will come as no surprise to my colleagues, <clears throat> that I especially like the renovated and repurposed uh, uh, value there uh, as it pertains to our riverfront area. as as well as the connected and seamless values. I think those are exactly right for this area and for our community. And I wonder how much study meeting conversation have you had with those at the university and with the Fifth Street Public Market folks about their expansion plans on either side here? I'll let Jim talk about his uh, communication sure. with uh, the university. Um, let's see. I talked to Brian and Casey last night. I talked to Casey yesterday afternoon. Um, <laughs> we know what they're doing. We've shared with them everything that we're doing uh, early on, because obviously there's going to be a, there's synergy there, and they've done great things for the city, and we want to be partners with them and continue the work that they've done. Now, that's my point exactly, is that while this is amazing, this is a vision that everybody can get excited about because everybody that lives here loves our river. It doesn't happen in isolation. That's right. Right. That's right. Yeah. Everything about what will happen both here and around it is going to remake our community for decades. And I have said for as long as I can remember that I think this is the central part of our downtown and our community that is the most exciting part and for and an opportunity for us to reimagine our downtown and our community that will last for decades. And I think you are doing an excellent job of leading the way there. And thank you very much with this. I hope to see that you continue to work with the university and with the OBs and with everybody else in this area to build up the entirety of this area. Um, and I'm glad you're working so well with our staff. I, I hope that as time goes on, I, I still hold hope that we will, the city will be doing other redevelopment things in that area as well. Yeah, I don't want to tell you what to do, obviously, sure. but you know, our experience in what we've done on an urban basis, you have to have people downtown to have a good downtown yeah. I mean you got to get people to live downtown yeah. and if you have the right kind of buildings and the right kind of amenities and so on and so forth people will want to live downtown and the direction of Millennials if you will people that are certainly taken Jim's place they've long since taken my place <laughs> uh, that's where they want to live yeah everything about this screams vibrancy and the central focus of our downtown community and I I'm very excited to see it develop. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Ready? Thank you. Looks beautiful. I I wish there wasn't so much concrete. Um, and I do like Greg's. I was going to say something about transportation before Greg said it, but uh, I think if there was some kind of rotating circular transportation, it would be really good not to have so many cars near the river. Mm -hmm. um, I would like to see a bigger green space, but I wonder with a hotel. You said you, there would be parking if there's a hotel there. Yes, there would have to be a big parking lot, right? We've just like the other buildings. We've planned for some surface parking as well as tuck under parking around the building. So this like right the there, you mean? Yeah, the the area under the viaduct uh, offers itself up quite nicely for mm -hmm. some for some surface parking. 
<laughs> there, yeah, in lots of cities they have, I think what you mentioned, the building surrounds the parking. Correct. So you don't just see sea of cars. In in this case, there'll be some of it will be exposed. There'll, there'll be a, but from, for example, from this angle, you're you're seeing we've wrapped that parking. Now, if you were looking at it from underneath the viaduct, if I went back to the plan view, you might see some of that surface parking. But we agree, we want to try to minimize that. We think surface, you, know, you try to find ways to to to, to buffer that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, many hotel operators we work with as well don't actually have to have the parking right there on site next to the building. Sometimes they'll they'll find another off-site location and valet everyone over there. So there's there's ways to minimize those. That would be a good thing yeah. if we didn't. You have a lot of cars and a lot of pollution by the river. Yeah. Um, the affordable housing. I assume you mean subsidized housing. Yes, we do. I. I I would hope that we would be looking for inclusionary zoning instead of that. That's something the city has to. I understand Portland has inclusionary or started to have inclusionary zoning, right? E yes, mm -hmm. yes, it does. I think that would be much better than a than a project. But I. Uh, but um, the hotel. Well, I guess it all depends on your finding partners. It, that it does. Yes. yes. Uh, as a person who has been a proponent, I've made a lot of enemies in the development community oh. because I am uh, one of three people on the Portland Housing Bureau's uh, executive committee. I became a lobbyist for the first time in late 2016 or 17, whenever it was. I was asked by the mayor and Commissioner Saltzman to go to Salem and uh, try to develop bipartisan support to allow Portland to try inclusionary zoning. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure Eugene's ready for it. What we should do is watch and see how Portland is doing. It's, it's, it's struggling, but it's, it's, a, it's an experiment that I think is worthy of trying, and, I'm, and that's why I supported it. Uh, it's generating some uh, results in Portland. But if you really want to help people in the community at this point in time, I think you should be building a building that architecturally is compatible with the rest of the neighborhood so you don't walk by it and say that's where the poor people live. And uh, I think you should do a building that's oriented to people that are in the 60% uh, or below of median family income. Okay. Um, I like what you said about the railroads. I think people can live by railroads compatibly, but sure. the, it isn't as if it's something that goes on 24 hours a day anyway. But And and are you planning for people to have private lawns? Or? No. The townhouses would sit on, on fee simple land. People would own their own home, but these will be small lots and, and really just be more patios and, and uh, access space. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Claire? Thank you. Well, thank you very much for this very exciting presentation. Um, I'm, I am very excited by the vision you've presented here and how you are approaching this project and the other activities occurring nearby, like the Fifth Street Market District. I think you've built upon and even improved many features of the original master plan concept. And I feel like it seems to be more integrated with the open space and the river view than previous concepts that we've had a chance to look at. So I concur with your conclusion that continuing to try and incorporate the Bow Trust building and the other maintenance building into the plans created too great a barrier to reach some of the other values that we have for the project. I did want to ask city staff if, or maybe you guys know, if our current code um, provides for the businesses within homes and the live-work uh, scenarios that you spoke of that are, exist in the Pearl District. I'm going to defer that one to city staff. <laughs> we know that's true, Robin. If it doesn't, we'll want to move towards that. I think right. that's an excellent idea. Um, I'm very interested in figuring out how that Fifth Street, excuse me, Fifth Avenue extension works and looking forward to hearing from our staff how the cost of that, you know, is relative to the 
realignment of eighth that we talked about. If we don't need to do that, you know, how the, that uh, affects the bottom line. Um, in uh, relation to the train, so we are um, in the process of uh, working towards funding for a quiet zone. Um, so one of the features that we um, are planning for that is a fence along the train tracks. And so in your vision for Fifth Avenue, there was no fencing. So it, it might not look as beautiful and straight through with the practical implications of the safety features that we'd need to have at the crossing there. So I just wanted to make sure you guys had that in mind. Um, and then I think, uh, you know, in the future, a bike ped bridge to Alton Baker Park um, would be a very valuable addition to this effort to connect our downtown to the river. Um, one thing that seems to be a little different from past concepts is we, we had this reference to Restaurant Row, which gave the impression of multiple restaurants. So I'm assuming some of the mixed-use retail would include opportunities for cafes and, and smaller eating establishments. Yes, we want to balance the retail and, and make sure that it's sustainable. Okay. Uh, the one restaurant that you put in the concept seems pretty large in scale, uh, and I wonder if there would be opportunity for maybe making it two different venues that kind of We're occupied that same space. Okay. Um, and then a couple of last comments. I prefer the way you have traffic flowing, car traffic flowing through this on the edge of the development rather than through the center, as the other concept used to have, and exploring shared parking is going to be definitely needed. And I like how you seem to have created more open space within the development than rather just along the edges, as we saw. But I do think it could use a couple more water features uh, in there. Uh, and I just want to ask if all of those open spaces will be public space or if some of them will be privately controlled. The, the riverfront plaza space uh, we've proposed as public space. The space under the viaduct, that, that open space pocket park, is still an item that we're discussing, just more related to what, what would go there, what would be the program, and then how would it be jointly managed and maintained. So I wouldn't say that that question's been answered, but our, our proposal has been that the riverfront plaza we've proposed be public. Thank you. All right. Emily. Thank you. <clears throat> this is uh, exciting, and wow, you did a really good job. Thank you. Um, how big is the riverfront park? Um, can you compare it to how much of a block it would be? The, the riverfront plaza? Uh, the green space, the public green space. Let me make sure we're talking about the same. Wait, whack. Right there. Yeah. Yeah, the lime green space on the right. That that green space right there yeah. is about 42,000 square feet, just under an acre. Yep. It's just under an acre. And how much is a city block? The Eugene block? Yeah, two about two and a half. Yeah. Two and a half what? Acre. acre. So it's about a fifth of a city block? No, no, no. It's no, approximately no, no. It's just under half. Half, okay. Yeah. Great. 43,560 feet in acre. We'll do a Portland city block. We have smaller blocks, but yeah. yeah. I'd go to Portland. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's, it's easier for me to compare it to a block since we have an empty one over there. Um, I, I think the Riverfront Park Plaza is really critical to this. I, I'm also liking that it's in the inside and the traffic's around the outside. Um, I just am um, a little leery of if it's enough, uh, like a lot of concrete and brick stuffed in there, and uh, green space, once you build on it, is gone. So I'm concerned about that a little bit. Um, would you include some play structures down there to invite children and families? Yes, we've, we've talked about the opportunity, particularly at this space right there in that riverfront plaza, to being a, a space that would lend itself to a, a natural play area, perhaps. Um, and I think that bridge is really critical, especially because it's going to be so built up and across the river, I'm hoping we're not going to build that up, uh, it would be a pretty quick way to bring that section into a green part. So I'm really in favor of moving that up in the, the project. Um, how many people are we talking about housing? We're, the total development density would be approximately 400 to 450 units or uh, uh, homes. 
uh, including including hotel rooms. So if you had you know a couple people per home on average, you know, you're talking about perhaps 800. 800 residents, 800, 900 residents, including the guests that would be staying at the hotel. Remember, there's a mix of market rate apartments, affordable apartments, the for sale townhomes, and the hotel. Um, and together would be about 400 to 450 rooms or, or units. Or units, yeah. you, you, units, rather. And you know, if you assumed a couple people per home. How many units would be in the hotel? I'm interested in how many people we're going to find permanent housing for. There. We, we, yeah, we've uh, of that of the 400 and call it 450, approximately 125 of those would be the hotel. So we're talking about 375. So we might have or, 700 people there, or something like that. Um, and affordable housing is 60 percent or below. And that that uh, I don't know that I feel that's enough of a mix mixed use. I'm really leery of gentrification and I want there to be more people of, of a variety of income levels. Uh, my understanding of inclusionary zoning from the state law is that you can do it in lieu of fee rather than including those uh, units right there. So that's a concern to me also. I would want low income housing uh, to of course be aesthetic and fit in. But uh, it's a goal of mine to keep our, our neighborhoods as mixed as possible. And since uh, middle and low low is so low, I hope that will get addressed. Um, I might need a second. Let me, let me make a couple. comment about that. I'll, I'll ask you a question. What neighborhood do you think in Portland has the highest percentage of affordable housing units? Answer? The Pearl District. That's what I would have guessed because yeah. it's new. Yeah. But so it can be done. It can be blended in very well. Everybody gets along. You're, you, it's the right thing to do. Typically what I'm seeing in people that I help uh, and work with on affordable housing and as my position at the Portland Housing Bureau as an advisor is there is a big push and it all depends on money for including people who fall in the range of zero to 30, which of median family income, which is called permanent supportive housing, right? So many of these people are, that fall in that category are veterans. Those veterans are able to get what's called a VASH voucher, which would be very diff, uh, somewhat similar to a Section 8 voucher to help people with their rent. So. I, I agree with everything that you said. Thanks. Um, last thing I'd like to see is look into a little bit more underground parking. I know it's expensive, but if we're going to have density, we need to not have surface parking as much. Thank you very much. You're welcome. All right, Alan, did you want a second round? Yeah, I was just going to we... follow up on the, on the affordable housing portion of it. Do you guys envision doing that project or Partnering with someone like our hacks are uh, no, we, we you you have affordable housing providers here, and uh, I'm sure they're capable of getting the job done. If there's anything that we could do to help or assist, we would. But we don't see ourselves taking a major role in in the project. It's not what we do for a business. I I do this because or I do the activities in the affordable housing because it's something that's important to me personally. Yeah, good. I applaud you for that as well. Thanks. Thank you. Emily, you want another? Are you done? Okay, Greg, go for it. Uh, uh, back to the steam plant. Um, are we still having uh, issues with DEQ as far as, um, you know, being able to, to repurpose that, that facility, or are we clean on that? I can't yeah, answer that. I haven't done it, so I would defer that to staff. Uh, we'll get back to you for sure. Uh, I don't know of any DEQ-related issues on the steam plant. You know, eWeb has done quite a bit of work for uh, taking out asbestos and doing some of those other kinds of things. We'd be happy to get you a bit more information, though. Yeah, because that means what is it qualified as right now? Is it brownfield, blackfield? Uh, I don't know, but we'll get that to you for sure. Okay. And Mike. Thank you, Mayor. One of the original slides, one of the first ones you had up there in the first, I don't know, third or so. Would you like me to go 
Uh, golly, I don't know if I can. It listed some of the uses of the building. Oh, so, oh here we so, go. Uh, Why don't you go to the next right, one? Right, that one. Let's take a look here. Yeah. Existing eWeb HQ future adaptive reuse. So my question is, um, obviously that will be used for something else at some point and it's in immediate proximity to this development. Um, is there a realistic, a, a potential use of that building, depending on who they sell it to, that would be disadvantageous to your plans? Nothing immediately comes I, I, to mind. I don't think so. Um, no. Okay. Thanks. Emily, um, the retail, how much office space would there possibly be since one of our considerations may be putting City Hall in the eWeb building? Uh, would there be space for support offices as opposed to just retail? We haven't studied the eWeb building at all. It's not part of the transaction. No, I didn't want you to. I'm just talking about the buildings here that are retail. Would there possibly be some office space oh, on the second floor? Oh, I'm sorry. I, th I thought this was in reference no, to the eWeb. I'm no. sorry. Uh, n n n no, I don't I don't think so. The, the kind of neighborhood uh, retail we're talking about would, would be a modest amount. Again, not wanting to um, develop so much that requires a a lot of parking um, and developing enough and, and positioning it enough so that it's a small amount it can it can be sustainable so it's mostly going to be housing then the, y yes yes Thanks. Um, and I also like uh, going up to three maybe even four stories because again if we went up to four in the back we could house more people or put in a floor of little offices thank you <laughs> Alan, you had one yeah, more? Following on that, uh, roughly what's the ratio of commercial to residential, including residential be the hotel as well? Um, but we're... It looks like about 80-20. Oh, it's... It, um, if, we, if we're excluding the steam plant, there would be approximately approximately 25,000 square feet of retail versus approximately 300,000, so it's more like 10%. 10, 10%. Right. Okay, anybody else? We have three minutes to go. No? Okay. Thank you very much. This is just inspiring and exciting, and we really look forward to the next step. So appreciate all the work you have done and the quality of this presentation to us, which was wonderful. Well, again, we want to thank your staff for all their hard work, and you got a good crew, and uh, we're ready to go to work. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks all right. Again. We, are, we are done.